So thank you for being here, Thing. We are Team Gator Domination, and we are here today to present to you our um, design um, aircraft, the Chi-11 War Gator. I am Randy Chiron. I'm Matthew Ludden. Matthew Madelon. Garrett Morgan. Uh, Ryan Ryan. Ryan. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. Uh, my name is Roger Rosogi, but you can call me Raj. Any young. So without further ado, let's begin. So as you know, uh, the CHI-11 is our proposal to the AIAA 2021 undergraduate aircraft design competition. And there are several requirements for this competition. Um, one of the most notable ones being is that our aircraft has to perform takeoff and landing on an austere field in less than 4,000 feet. And essentially the austere field is a, a semi-prepared runway that's built on grass and dirt. Another requirement is that our aircraft has to be able to hold 3,000 pounds of armaments, including a variety of weapons, but that does not include the integrated gun. The aircraft has to complete two types of missions. The first one being the design mission. Next slide, please. Uh, and as you can see that this design mission is a typical ground support attack uh, mission characterized by two crew segments and one four hour loiter segment. The next mission is the ferry mission, which is a typical long range mission characterized by a 900 nautical mile cruise segment. So uh, without further ado, we have to come, uh, we have to uh, determine some preliminary estimations. And we had to, um, and we just determined the design takeoff weight as one of our first estimations. And we did it, we determined the design takeoff weight for both a propeller aircraft and a jet aircraft to help us determine uh, which type of aircraft we would use. And we also determined the design takeoff weight for the design and ferry missions. So the design takeoff weight is essentially the sum of the payload weight, the crew weight, the fuel weight, and the empty weight. And since we already know the payload weight and the crew weight, we can uh, rearrange the design takeoff weight as a function of the fuel weight fraction and the empty weight fraction. The fuel weight fraction is essentially a function of the uh, mission weight fraction itself, which is a ratio of the weight uh, after the mission over the weight uh, before the mission began. And that is essentially a product of the weight fraction for each uh, mission segment. So we determined, um, all, the, all these uh, weight fractions based off historical data, or we calculated it using the Breguet uh, equations. The empty weight fraction was obtained from trends of historical data, and it essentially, and uh, we uh, determined it as a uh, e exponential function uh, of the design takeoff weight itself. And uh, with A and C um, varying for each type of aircraft. So uh, we had to use numerical methods to solve for the, uh, to uh, determine the design takeoff weight itself. And we ended up with a design takeoff weight of 25,333 pounds. As you can see that the, um, the design mission had a larger weights than the ferry mission. And the propeller aircraft had a much larger uh, weight and the jet aircraft was much more fuel efficient as well, which is why we decided to design our aircraft based off the jet aircraft. The next estimation we uh, calculated was the thrust to weight, which helped us determine our critical thrust requirement for the uh, aircraft itself. We calculated it. We calculated the thrust to weight at takeoff, cruise, and climb using Raymer's equations, and we obtained and we plugged in values based off of other aircrafts, uh, values from like other similar aircrafts and historical data as well. We ended up with a uh, the highest thrust to weight ratio at takeoff, which was expected. And that led to our critical thrust requirement of 11,000 pounds. The next uh, estimation we did was the wing loading, which is, a, which is the ratio of the weight of the aircraft over the planform area of the wing. And we calculated at three conditions, the stall condition, the takeoff condition, and the landing condition. And we calculated the, uh, and we plugged, uh, we used Raymer's equations and plugged in values from other aircrafts and, uh, uh, and we determined values from historical data as well. We ended up with a uh, wing, uh, we used the smallest wing loading for this case because that would result in the largest wing area. And we ended up with uh, 49.4 pounds per square foot. However, uh, we wanna iterate that this is, these are just preliminary estimations. And uh, we had to perform many um, 
And we had to perform many iterative process to actually design our aircraft. Uh, thus, that, with that being said, we uh, determined that 49.4 was pretty small for the type of aircraft that we wanted to uh, design because 49.4 was typical for most jet trainers and we wanted to design an aircraft that was between the size of a jet trainer and a jet fighter. Um, and typical jet fighter aircrafts had a wing loading of 125. So we decided to choose a wing loading between those values of 89 pounds per square foot. And that led to our critical wing area requirement of 300 square feet. So after we completed our preliminary estimations, um, we moved on to the designing the propulsion system for the plane. So we decided to go with twin Honeywell F-124 low bypass turbofan engines. There were basically two factors that led us to the decision to um, include twin, en twin engines on the aircraft. Um, the first being survivability. Um, as a combat aircraft, we wanted to ensure that um, an engine failure would not result in the catastrophic failure of the entire aircraft. Um, the second was intake complexity. Um, a single engine would require um, with the type of inlets that we were planning to use would require a wide duct, um, which added complexity and, and design cost. Um, next, we moved into engine selection. And the three engines that we considered were the F-124, the GE F-404, and the Pratt Whitney F-135. The latter two um, were much larger than our, um, you know, our critical thrust was around 11,000 pounds. So for twin engines, um, we estimated about 6,000 pounds for each to give us a bit of a safety factor. And so the latter two were much larger than that. So we used a scale factor to scale them down. Um, we did a design matrix and looked at the length, the weight, the specific fuel consumption and the cost of all three engines. And we decided to go with the Honeywell F-124 um, due in large part to the fact that we didn't have to scale it. Um, off the shelf, it has about 6,000 pounds of thrust each. So we wouldn't have to um, do any redesigns of the engine. From there, we moved on to designing the inlets. Um, and we chose to use armpit located inlets, um, pitot inlets that are the most efficient for this type of aircraft. Um, and then from there, we decided on fixed converging nozzles. Variable area nozzles were also considered, but due to the fact that we are not gonna be um, in the supersonic regime, fixed converging nozzles um, are enough for our purposes. Um, and then finally for the fuel system, um, our plane will carry 110 cubic feet of JP-8 jet fuel held in self-sealing bladder style tanks. Um, and that again was for survivability to ensure that um, a hit to the fuel tank, which is quite common um, during combat missions would not result in a, a catastrophic failure of the plane. The installed engine parameters, um, as you can see, there's some thrust loss due to um, pressure loss of the inlet, as well as to pressure bleeding throughout the, the engine cycle. Um, we calculated a total installed thrust of 11,970 pounds. So still a safety margin um, from our critical thrust, which was around 11,000 pounds. Um, also the specific fuel consumption, um, we anticipate an increase in that once it's once installed due to um, inefficiencies of the installed engines. So that's about 0.975. So for the wing design, um, the first thing we did was select an airfoil because our initial estimation said that we were gonna be flying it during cruise in about the Mach 0.7 uh, transonic regime, which shows a transonic airfoil, the RAE 5212, which helps to uh, reduce the uh, lift penalties and uh, drag increase due to local shocks forming during the uh, transonic regime. Um, in terms of overall dimensions, we designed it uh, based on the 300 square foot um, requirement for the approximate wing loading. Um, we designed it to be able to produce the maximum lift, which we estimated would be uh, about 25,500 pounds at 30,000 feet, which is the most critical requirement where the air is the thinnest. Um, and based on that, we were able to size the wing to uh, 312 and a half square feet, which uh, gives a coefficient of lift of 0.159 at 30,000 feet at cruise. That's uh, a lift number of about 26,500 feet. So just over a thousand pounds uh, safety factor. Um, in terms of geometry, it has a 15 degree leading edge sweep. That again, uh, has to do with the transonic regime. It ensures that the airflow perpendicular to the leading edge is subsonic uh, and prevents uh, local shocks and sub supersonic flow from forming on the wing. Uh, we have a negative two and a half geometric twist at the wing tip which ensures that uh, if stall occurs on the wing, the root stalls before the tip, 
So if the plane does stall, the pilot is able to maintain lateral control with the ailerons. Uh, we also have swept back wing tips. The goal of that is to minimize the wingtip vortices that form at the edge of the wings and can increase drag. Um, at the takeoff condition, we estimated that the coefficient of lift is going to be just under 1.4, and we estimated that we would need about uh, two to be able to take off in the run rate requirement. So we added high lift devices, um, single slotted flaps that run 60% of the span of the wing and 25% of the cord uh, that will increase the coefficient of lift of the wing to about 2.1 uh, at the takeoff condition, which is uh, an angle attack of 15 degrees. Um, but because the, the flaps uh, increase the angle of attack or decrease the stall angle of the wing, we also added leading edge slaps leading edge slats um, that uh, counter that. So we can get an increased lift without uh, lowering the stall angle of the wing. Uh, for the aileron dimensions, we're having them at 40% of the span of the wing and 25% of the cord. That span number just includes the main wing. It doesn't include the wing tip. So the ailerons will actually start right here and then run 40% of the span. And the goal of that is to uh, help reduce the flutter tendency when you have ailerons at the end of the wing. For the uh, vertical tail design, we chose an H tail configuration. Uh, the two main factors were uh, number one, we were trying to reduce the side profile and thereby the radar cross section of the plane because it is going to be flying into combat zones and possibly over uh, enemy territory. So that was a survivability consideration. Um, and also we wanted to uh, keep the aerodynamic center of the vertical tail close to the center of gravity, which would reduce the roll contribution of the vertical tail and make for a uh, more controllable aircraft. Um, the H tail also has the survivability benefit that if the tail takes damage, um, there's still some part of the vertical tail that could help maintain control. For the geometry, um, we sized the leading edge uh, to basically just give a straight uh, hinge line for the rudder. So these uh, uh, leading edge sweeps are kind of arbitrary. We chose a NACA 0010 airfoil. Uh, it's a symmetric airfoil. Really, the two choices were 0010 or 0012. We chose the 0010 for the vertical stabilizer because it's uh, a smaller airfoil, so it would reduce the weight of the vertical stabilizer, which is going to have to be supported uh, entirely by the horizontal stabilizer. Um, and for the rudder, we chose dimensions to be 80% of the span and 30% of the cord. The horizontal tail, um, again, it's the H tail configuration. Uh, we gave it a 15 degree dihedral because one of the drawbacks of the H tail configuration is it keeps the uh, horizontal tail relatively close to the engine exhaust because we are using uh, arm pit mounted engines. So by adding a slight dihedral of 15 degrees, it moves the horizontal stabilizer and the rudder deflection well outside of the engine jet wake, um, which means that there will be no interference. So the pilot will be able to maintain control for all rudder deflections. Uh, that gave overall a 56.3 square foot planform area. But again, because of the dihedral, that's a 54.3 square foot uh, projected area. And then for the uh, horizontal stabilizer, we chose a 0012 airfoil uh, to allow more uh, internal volume for the support structure that would be required for the uh, vertical stabilizers. And then for the elevator, we chose the span to be 90% of the horizontal stabilizer and 30% of the cord. All right. Once the wing geometric dimensions have been um, established, we can then talk about the um, structure of the actual wing itself. We have chosen to go along with uh, a ribs and sparse arrangement, um, which is typical for um, jet aircrafts nowadays. And on top of that, we also are going to be incorporating um, skins and stringers for the load carrying um, capabilities. So um, in terms of the skin um, themselves, we have three skin designations. So as you, as you can see, skin A, skin B, and skin C, and they differ by their thicknesses because the skins further away from the wing root, so namely here, they would um, experience le relatively less loading. We thought that we can reduce their thickness to reduce cost and weight. As for uh, the ribs themselves, they are shaped after the RAE 5212 airfoil. So you can see the ribs here, um, that they're marked here. Um, and 
as for the spars, we will have three main spars, which will run from wing root to wing tip. Um, and there will also be two intermediate spars that only run from wing root to the seventh rib over here. The, this design was meant so that there will be more spars supporting the um, area near the wing root, because again, they would relatively experience larger loading to um, prevent a failure of that structure. All the spars would be designed to be 0.82 inch thick. And this um, thickness was um, calculated using the preliminary wing box analysis done on the wing itself. Um, in terms of the material um, that they're going to be made up of, um, the wing attachment here will be made out of titanium TI6A14V because we need um, the the strength um, of the titanium there, because it would it's a critical part of the wing attachment to the fuselage. Um, another reason for choosing titanium is because it would be closer to the engine, so we need a more heat resistant uh, material. Other than the wing attachment, all the wing structures would be made out of high strength graphite epoxy. One drawback of high strength graphite epoxy is that it is um, harder to maintain because it's costlier and harder to repair. However, um, their high, extremely high strength to weight ratio is the deciding factor for us um, for including them in our design. Once the um, structural um, dimensions have been um, constructed, we move on to analyzing the wing structure using a finite element analysis software, namely Abacus. The wing loading itself was modeled using an elliptical lift distribution acting along the wing quarter cord which is around here. So um, it was found that the factor of the factor of safety of the wing turns out to be 1.6. And this factor of safety was analyzed using the criterion of comparing the ultimate tensile strength against the absolute max principal stress. Um, it should be noted that we desire an overall safety factor of 1.5 for the whole aircraft. So the wing safety factor is above that. From the um, stress analysis, it was also found that the maximum vertical displacement of the tip of the wing was 25.4 inches, which is again, um, for, for this kind of aircraft, it is typical, it is below the safety limit. Um, from the stress contour plot, we would also use that to um, introduce stringers because the stringers would then help the skin um, to prevent them from buckling under the load. So where, where there would be um, high stress regions based on the contour plot, we would introduce stringers there. Aside from the stringers, we would also introduce flanges to connect the spars to the skin. And at the wing root here, the spars would be about 15 inches from each other, while the stringers and flanges would be spaced out by about five inches. And the thicknesses of these string, stringers and flanges are both going to be 0.1 inches. A diagram with dimensions for the cockpit SOLIDWORKS assembly can be seen in the top right. As per the RFP, the cockpit was required to carry two people, each with zero zero ejection seats. A tandem cockpit design was chosen to keep the frontal aerial area minimal, and the second crew member was seated directly behind the pilot. The overall cockpit dimensions can be seen on the slide, and the cockpit itself was sized according to the dimensions put forth in Raymer's aircraft design. Including, including the dimensions such as head clearance, seat back angle, and transparency glaze angle. These dimensions uh, are also listed on the slide. It is also worth noting that the canopy is bulletproof and the cockpit itself is enclosed in ceramic component armor to increase the survivability of the aircraft to enemy fire. Uh, moving on to the fuselage, uh, the SOLIDWORKS part for it can be seen in the bottom right. Uh, the fuselage length, width, and height can also be seen on the slide and the primary uh, driver of the fuselage design was putting the most important objects in the correct place. Uh, these include putting the wing in its aerodynamic center at the expected CG, uh, making the fuselage long enough to put the tail in the correct position, placing the heaviest object centered and high within the fuselage to keep the CG closer to the wing's aerodynamic center. These include items such as the engines, fuselage fuel tank, generators, uh, other aircraft systems components, and also uh, ordnance. So uh, space was also located outside outboard of the engines for the main gear to be retracted. Uh, this allowed for the lowest fuselage weight and drag while also giving sufficient main gear geometry positions. 
Um, and the fuselage was also designed to properly position the cockpit, nose gear, gun, uh, leftover aircraft systems and components and put them all in uh, sufficient positions. After all of these components and their positions were finalized, the fuselage curves were designed to enclose all of these aircraft components while also minimizing the fuselage drag, um, giving the fuselage its distinct central narrow shape while uh, semi-recessed slash semi-nacelle positions for the engine and uh, main gear. Uh, a few more comments uh, based off of historical data. Um, <laughs> The finest ratio was chosen to be 4.2. This was deemed sufficient for uh, subsonic flight regime of the Chi 11. The overnose angle was positioned or put at 17.9 17 degrees, uh, which is sufficient to give proper pilot view during takeoff and landing on austere runways. It is also worth noting that the fuselage contains ceramic component armor around the engines, uh, which also increases the aircraft survivability. Sorry, the, stru the structure of the fuselage uh, is a semi-monocoque structure made up of frames, bulkheads, stringers, and skin. Um, as you can see, uh, as Matthew had said before, the center of the fuselage is actually the um, the most uh, the uh, the part of the fuselage with the heaviest loads, and that's why in the center of the fuselage, the bulkheads we have five bulkheads as you can see here. Um, each um, bulkhead is made of a titanium alloy and the skin is made up of an aluminum alloy while the engines are mounted uh, are the engines are mounted uh, using aircraft steel. Now uh, the frames which are essentially these thin lines here while the bulkheads are these thicker lines um, the, the bulkheads are actually placed in parts of the fuselage that are, that will that are expected um, to experience large large amounts of load. So as you can see here, we have the um, we have one at the beginning of the cockpit, one after the cockpit, one at the beginning of the tail section, and two over here um, at the empennage. Um, the frames and the bulkheads itself are spaced uh, across the fuselage uh, and each of the spacings are around 19 to 24 inches, which was deemed sufficient by um, Roscom's uh, guidelines. And the depth of each frame and bulkhead are uh, two inches. Now the rest of the um, material around the, uh, apart from the center, the center part of the fuselage, the frames, the bulkheads and the stringers are all gonna be made of, of high strength graphite epoxy. The stringers themselves, which run longitudinally across this diagram right here, uh, are expected to have a Z-type cross section, which are, uh, which have a very, which have a very simple design, and uh, also have a very are are very structurally efficient for the um, fuselage itself. And as per Rossum's guidelines, they're all uh, spaced across the fuselage by 10 to 12 inches. Uh, tricycle configurations chosen um, as the other configurations we looked at all had a disqualifying trait such as a tail dragger being dynamically unstable and uh, something like a bicycle configuration being unable to rotate on takeoff, increasing takeoff the distance. Uh, the tricycle configuration also has the added benefit of being dynamically stable. So that's the configuration we ended up going with. Um, also listed on the slide, uh, we designed for a clearance for the fuselage um, from the ground of 34.5 inches, for the intakes from the ground of 45.3 inches, and for the ordnance from the ground, uh, 21 inches minimum. Um, also listed on the slide, uh, we have dimensions for the, uh, the wheelbase dimensions, uh, such as the <clears throat> tip back angle and wheel wheelbase length and width. Um, all landing gear tire pressure was designed to be under 100 PSI, which is sufficient for austere runways. Um, <clears throat> and also uh, for every single main, or for every single leg, we chose a trailing link oleo design um, for the superior performance it would provide on austere runways. Moving on to the main and nose gear themselves, the SolidWorks assembly for the nose gear can be seen in the top right, and the SolidWorks assemblies for the main gear can be seen in the bottom right, with the extended on the left and the retracted on the right. Uh, dimensions for the designed load 
tire diameter and oleo dimensions for the nose and main gear can be seen in their respective sections on the slide. And the nose gear retracts by retracting, rotating backwards into the fuselage. Uh, the nose gear was designed with a fork to make it symmetrical, which would reduce the fuselage space required to accommodate it retracted. Um, the main gear retracts by uh, having the lever arm, the forward piece fixed within the fuselage, uh, the oleo would slide backwards, retracting the wheel up. Uh, the whole assembly is then actuated and lifted up within the allocated retraction space within the fuselage. In order to fulfill the weapons and payload requirement, our aircraft selected a variety of weapons, including a gun, missiles, bombs, and rockets. The selected gun for our aircraft was the M61A2, which was mounted on our nose. It was selected in order to provide air and ground support, and it was selected because it is frequently used in the U.S. military for fixed-wing aircraft. In terms of missiles, we have one air-to-air -air missile. Um, this is the AIM-9, uh, AIM, uh, and this was selected because it's a lightweight infrared tracking missile, which can provide defense against enemy aircrafts. Um, we have two air-to-ground missiles selected. This is the AGM-65 and the AGM-114. Um, these were selected because they're able to penetrate and destroy hem heavily armored vehicles. In terms of bombs, we have the GBU-12 and the GBU-39. Uh, these were selected uh, by weight class because there was a maximum 500 pound weight limit. Um, the GBU-12 was selected because it has a more powerful blast radius than the GBU-39. However, the GBU-39 has a custom carriage that makes it so that uh, four bombs can be held at once. Um, for our air to ground rocket, we have uh, the uh, Hydra 70. Um, this was used for troop suppression and it was selected because it was used by the US military. Um, in order to mount these uh, weapons, we have nine hard points on our plane. Uh, there are three on each wing and uh, three under the fuselage. Um, this makes it so that weapons can be interchangeable depending on the mission. Um, and so to mount these uh, weapons, we have different weapon release mechanisms. We have three rail launch mechanisms that correspond to each missile, two ejection launch mechanisms that correspond to each bomb, and we have two rocket launch mechanisms. The first one actually holds seven missiles at a time, and the second one holds 19 missiles at a time. Recalling what Tiffany said about the nine hard points and interchanging the weapons, we have also designed several possible mission and weapon configurations. Um, keep, uh, keep in mind that this aircraft is meant to be a close air support, so the missions we have designed are also related to that type of mission. The first um, type of mission is an anti-armor mission, so this mission would focus on uh, carrying missiles which are uh, mostly air to ground and anti tank or anti armor. So, like the AGM 65D and the AGM 114. Um, and the second type of mission would be more of a heavy bombing type of mission, um, where again, we mainly carry the uh, precision bombs, such as the GBU 39 and the GBU 12. Um, we also would carry the AGM 114 missiles and AM, AIM 9 missiles for um, air defense um, and emergency purposes. Um, the third type of mission is a, an anti-personal um, type of mission whereby the enemy troops are possibly spread out over a large area. Um, so we would require more um, air to ground rockets such as the, the, like the Hydra 70 rockets and also um, again the AGM-114 missiles which are the air to ground rockets. And the fourth type of mission um, is a general purpose mission mainly um, designed to um, show the different types of weapons that we can carry um, across our um, hard points. It should be noted that um, in no, in, there's no mission where all nine hard points are chosen, uh, are used. Um, like for example, if, as you can see in the mission for um, configuration on the right, we only use eight hard points where the, the middle hard point under the fuselage was not used. And uh, keep in mind that the payload requirement was around 3,000 pounds, and as you can see, all four missions have a payload of 
again, approximately 3,000 pounds fulfilling the mission requirement, the RFP requirement. The subsystems in the CHI-11 were chosen by referencing similar planes. The data bus and the ICNIA are located below the cockpit because they relay information to the head-up display, which then displays the information to the pilot and the co-pilot in the cockpit. The CHI-11 has two electric generators, which are located between the engines. This location simplifies the wiring layout since it is centrally located. Below the two generators are two hydraulic pumps. Their location allows for quick response time from the cockpit to the pumps and then to the control body. The metrics of these two subsystems are typical for jet fighters. The OBIGs and OBOGs, which are located in the tail, are part of the environmental control system. They ensure safe conditions by controlling the temperature and air quality, keeping the pilot and the co-pilot safe within the cockpit. The APU, which is located below the horizontal stabilizer, is used in emergency situations. If the hydraulic pumps fail, the APU will restart them with pressurized air. And if the engines fail, the APU is able to restart them using power from batteries in the plane. The APU has an intake valve above the unit, which accepts clean air and an exhaust which runs out the back of the tail. So as you can see, uh, after uh, determining all the subsystem components and designing the aircraft, we uh, obtained a refined weight approximation, which were all uh, determined using Raymer's statistical weight formulas for our typical uh, fighter aircrafts. Uh, as you can see, our maximum takeoff weight was uh, 24,000 pounds, 24,266 pounds. And as you can see in this pie chart, which has a weight distribution of all the um, components for the maximum takeoff weight, it is mainly uh, the largest components are the fuel weight, the weapons weight, and the systems weight. Um, the, the empty takeoff weight does not include the fuel and the weapons. So we ended up with a empty takeoff weight of 15,643 pounds. And the fuel weight itself was uh, 5,162 5, pounds. This was actually uh, lower than our estimated value for the fuel weight determined in the first part of this presentation. Uh, it was around uh, 6,900 pounds. Uh, our estimation was around 6,900 pounds, but we determined that 50, uh, this fuel weight of 5,100 uh, pounds was actually uh, sufficient enough based off the performance analysis. Another key point when it comes to weights is um, determining the center of gravity, uh, mainly due to the fact that the center of gravity would largely determine the stability analysis, which we would do later um, in the design process. So um, based on a table of um, all the weights, components, and their moments, plus the um, CAD modeling, we have found that our center of gravity in the X direction, which is along the fuselage, it's about 24.71 feet aft of the nose. In the Y direction, it is actually um, Y equals zero, or if you can visualize, it's along the fuselage center line because of the symmetry of the aircraft. And in the Z direction, which is the vertical direction, it was found that the center of gravity is 6.52 feet from the ground. And you can see the center of gravity marked on the figure on the bottom right. Next slide, please. Another key component about center of gravity is um, figuring out the center of gravity envelope. This is important because as during the, the different phases of the mission, the center of gravity actually will shift due to possibly um, due to burn fuel, drop payload, um, gear retracted, and etc. Um, in the CJ envelope that you can see on the right, um, we have set the forward and the aft CG limits um, based on the landing gear geometry, specifically the wheel-based distance, which is the distance between the nose gear, nose wheel and the main wheel. And this is so that neither the nose wheel or the main wheel would carry uh, excessive load. We have found that the distance of the forward and aft CG limits is about 10.9% uh, of our mean aerodynamic cord of the wing. Um, this is slightly higher than a typical jet, which is about eight to 9%, but we have deemed it to be um, accept still acceptable. Um, another um, key point that uh, we can, another key to take away from the CJ envelope is that you can, as you can see, as the mission progress, 
um, the center of gravity actually mainly moves forward. Um, and this actually is making the aircraft more stable because it is increasing the distance between the center of gravity and the wing, um, air, wing, um, aerodynamic, wing um, aerodynamic center. In order to ensure the stability of our aircraft, we conducted longitudinal, lateral, and directional static stability analyses and with their respective trim analyses. For longitudinal static stability, we had to find the neutral point of the aircraft, which is the most aft position that the CG can be in order to still be stable. This was found as 300.03 inches, and the static margin was found to be 5%, which is typical for jet fighters. This uh, made it so that we found the pitch moment derivative as a negative number, which is important because in order to be longitudinally stable, the pitch moment derivative has to be negative. For the trim analysis, we had to make sure that the total pitch moment about the CG was zero for each segment. This included takeoff, cruise, and landing. In order to do that, we had to calculate the angle of attack, flap deflection, and elevator deflection for each segment um, that corresponded to a total pitch moment about the CG of zero. For lateral static stability, uh, in order to find the roll moment derivative, you would have to um, combine the effects of the wing and the tail. So we found the wing contribution and the tail contribution for the roll moment, which uh, in in that we calculated the roll moment derivative as also a negative number, which for lateral st static stability is stable. Um, for the lateral term analysis, we had to calculate the aileron control power. Um, this is the roll moment derivative due to the aileron deflection, and it prevents aircraft from rolling away during side slip or from slide, side slip. Uh, with that, we found the aileron control power as 0 0.0119. For directional static stability, uh, we had to find the yaw moment derivative, which is the sum of the yaw moment derivatives of each individual component. Uh, this is found to be a positive number, which for directional static stability is uh, considered stable. Uh, for the trim analysis, uh, we had to consider two cases, the engine out case and the crosswinds landing case. For the engine out case, uh, it was required that we maintain a zero side slip angle um, and a rudder deflection of less than 10, 20 degrees. For the crosswinds landing case, we had to, uh, we were required to maintain 11.5 side slip angle and a rudder deflection of less than 20 degrees. Uh, from that, we found the yaw moment coefficients for each case to be a positive number, which for directional static stability is stable. So overall, our aircraft was found to be stable. So after we completed all of those aspects of the design, um, we took another look at the performance analysis to ensure that the plane would meet all the requirements that it has to. Um, so first we looked at the top speed, um, which was found to be 629 miles per hour. Um, and that again was sort of found from this operating envelope, which is sort of a, um, to show the range of altitudes and velocities that the plane can handle. Um, the cruise speed was found to be Mach 0.7, um, about 0.85 of the top speed. The service ceiling was found to be 38,979 feet, um, which was well over the requirement of 30,000 um, for the service ceiling. The range was found to be 2,363 nautical miles, again, well over the requirement, um, which for the ferry mission required a 900 nautical mile um, cruise. The total endurance was 5.85 hours for the design mission, um, given a 4.75 hour um, requirement. And then for the ferry mission, it was 4.43 hours. There wasn't a, um, an endurance requirement for the ferry mission, just that we had to have 45 minutes of reserve fuel after completing the mission, which we do um, upon our analysis. The takeoff and landing distances were found to be 3,600 for takeoff and 2,294 for landing, um, well within the 4,000 foot um, limit set by um, the uh, request for proposal. And that's given um, an austere runway and um, at an altitude of up to 6,000 feet and clearing an obstacle of 50 feet um, for both of those. And then finally, the limit load factor was found to be plus nine and negative three Gs. Um, so the plane can handle um, a large number of combat maneuvers um, you know, when it's executing missions. 
The cost is broken up into three types of expenses, non-recurring, recurring, and operation and maintenance. The non-recurring is your initial fixed costs that do not repeat themselves with each unit. The recurring are expenses that come about with the production of each unit. And this, in the request for proposal, they stated 50, quantity, or 50 plans are gonna go into production. With manufacturing, there's something called a learning curve. So each unit that you produce, it becomes easier and therefore cheaper to produce. So the recurring costs would decrease with higher productions. Operation maintenance expenses occur with each flight cycle. For the Chi 11, the non-recurring costs totaled to about a billion dollars. The recurring totaled to about two billion and the operation maintenance, which once again is for each flight cycle, came out to just over, um, sorry, came out to just over $1,200. When calculating the unit cost, it's the sum of the non-recurring and the recurring divided by how many units go into production. And that number is 60.5 million for the Chi 11. As you can see throughout the design project, we have first um, identified the key requirements from the request for a proposal. And based on that, we um, did a, a, a lot of trade studies of similar aircraft, such as the Su-25, the Yacht-130. And based on those um, trade studies, we have assumed um, the, the main components, such as the weight fractions, the wing loading, the thrust to weight ratio. And based on those assumptions, we made, um, we established the structural designs um, and the geometry, such as the wing and the tail and the cockpit and fuselage. And based on our dimensions, we have verified the stability and the weights. And we, uh, after, after verifying the stability and the weights, we then um, analyzed the performance and we have deemed the performance to be satisfactory because they fulfilled the requirements of the design mission. So overall, we believe that we have responded effectively to the request for a proposal. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? Thank you very much for your presentation. It's uh, really very impressive. Um, so uh, also thank you uh, for our audience. Uh, we have several professors here, so... Um, <laughs> Uh, Professor Carroll, do you have any comments, suggestion, question? Oh, I've got a few questions and, and comments. I great, great. found your presentation interesting. I, I thought your design was very um, uh, innovative and I, you did some things that I, I found sort of unusual. Um, and on your structural design, I was, I was uh, curious on the multiple spars and I, I'm not a structural engineer, but I found that kind of curious and interesting. And, and then your use of graphite epoxy as well, um, kind of interesting. Um, and so you mentioned you used high strength graphite epoxy. What is high strength graphite epoxy? So we um, basically, we, when, when we were um, analyzing the wing structure, again, we saw the trade studies of the trend um, in fighter jets and, um, and lately is that they have been using a lot more composites in their, in their wing structure and fuselage. Um, so we looked into the type of, the specific type of composites that they've been using. And we found that high strength graphite epoxy um, was one of the type of um, composites that they've been using. And again, we, they, we took their, the properties of this high strength graphite epoxy and we run them through our um, wing box analysis and our FEA analysis. And it was found that um, it, was, uh, it, it fulfilled the safety factor of the uh, wing. When you do the, the when, well, when you lay up the epoxy, do you lay the fibers only in one direction or do you have, is it a multi-directional type uh, weave or? Right, so um, based on our research, it was found that the typical um, layout of the composites, it's usually 45 degree orientation to um, bending. And we also, yeah, um, there, are, there are multiple combinations of the, um, the fiber angle 
but we have chosen as of now our um, design. It, it may not be final, but it was found that a 45 degree fiber orientation fulfilled um, the requirement of the safety factor that we have set. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, aerodynamically, I noticed your nose cone was more of a conical shape. Um, why did you choose a cone for the front? Um, really to give the best view angle while still um, going into uh, like enclosing the, the objects that are going to be in the front, mainly the, uh, the gun. Um, and we also tried to go with that shape to give, uh, I guess, a good blend into the, the fuselage body around the cockpit and the cockpit canopy itself. Okay. Um, yeah. And so, so I noticed, so you have a sharp, more or less pointed nose, and then you have a sharp transition between the nose and the rest of the fuselage. And I was wondering about flow separation. Mm. So did you do any aerodynamic simulations? So when you're yawing and pitching and when you're at off design conditions, I'd be concerned about flow separation, what that do to your aerodynamic performance. Um, as of now, I don't believe we've done uh, too much in the way of aerodynamics simulations for the fuselage. Okay. Uh, the fuselage is has always sort of been a, work, a bit of a work in progress, just as we've continually been making more and more and more and more iterations and improvements. I think at this point, I honestly don't know what iteration we're on. It's It's currently this, however, it's still subject to change somewhat. Um, okay. Yeah, I was just so, kind of one thing I'll add. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Matthew. one thing I'll add that I think um, is important to note if we could go back one slide. Um, this this um, specific SOLIDWORKS part um, was sort of the initial fuselage concept. And then like Matthew was saying, the later stages, I believe the the transition from the cone to the um, cockpit section is more smooth um, rather than that that sharp um, sharp bend there. Oh okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one one thing I, I like to add also is uh, the one, we did have like one aerodynamic consideration um, that wasn't listed on the slide, but basically the taper angle for uh, this this doesn't have to do with the nose, but the the taper angle for the tail section um, we like based on um, other jets uh, and like uh, flow separation for other jets we uh, made the taper angle for the tail section less than I think it was a, around eight point three, two degrees, but essentially it had to be less than uh, 12 to 15 degrees. So uh, flow wouldn't separate at the tail. Yeah, and so your next picture, I think. Um, yeah, so on the bottom there where it transitions from horizontal to that, that's where you would get another separation. And, and you gotta be really careful about that, that mm -hmm. change in angle right there. Right. But you're going to get that adverse pressure gradient there. So that's good yeah. you were thinking about that. Yeah. So. We we've been trying to keep this all in mind. Um we it's just been very hard to do everything. Um in, like throughout the course of the semester. Um it's been a busy semester. It's it's on the list of things to do. It's just one of those things that we haven't exactly been able to get around to as of now. Okay. So. That's a that's a valid answer. So um mm -hmm. I, I was just curious what your thought processes were. So, um, um, all right, that, that's all I've got. Those, those were some of the things that popped out at me. I noticed uh, there was another slide. Um, you don't have to go to it, but you're talking about stability and you, I think you, your slide was written wrong. You said something about the center of gravity going aft and it would improve stability, but you, what you, uh, when you were talking, you said it different. You said the center of gravity would go forward with as it was operating, which sounded more reasonable to me. But and I'm not a stability and control guy either. But um, <clears throat> isn't it generally when your center of gravity moves forward, you're more stable? Yeah, you might check that slide. But um, yeah, uh, I believe it was moving forward. Yeah, I, I I might have said aft when I meant. Forward. No, no, you said it correctly. The slide was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the CG envelope, um, right? Yeah, yeah. The slide had a mistake, but you said it correctly. So, yeah. Um, that, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, right. No, I, I was going to write it down, and I was just ready to write it down. It's like I was going to pin you on it, but then you said it correctly, so I said, "Oh, the, the slide was just typed wrong." So. What one anyway. slide? Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs>
anyway, that was very good. So I, I liked, um, y'all tried some new stuff and it was kind of innovative. That was kind of cool to see. So, okay, that's all I have. Thank you so much, Professor Carroll. Yeah, um, thank you. We are glad that we have some professional guidance on aerodynamics. Mm -hmm. I, well, I, I, I think, I think Dr. Dong has more more professional experience than I do, but yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, Professor Trump, do you have any comments, suggestion, question, feedback, anything? Uh, Lopez, do you have any questions? No questions. I just came to see an arrow presentation provide some support. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. It was really good. Thank you. Thanks for um, coming. Thanks for uh, yeah. Yeah. No, we appreciate your time. <laughs> okay. Love you guys. Thank you. <laughs> thank Thanks. you. And and so uh, overall, really amazing job. I really like uh, the presentation and of course. The, your work of health master, I think you can feel based on my feedback in the mini reports. <laughs> and uh, for this uh, presentation, uh, so some very uh, minor question. Uh, first one is uh, wind structure. So uh, there's no page number, so <laughs> can you change it to the wind structure? This one or the or this one? Uh, next slide, next one. So uh, you use the ultimate strength uh, uh, versus the absolute maximum principal stress. So I was wondering why you use maps, uh, absolute maximum principal stress uh, instead of let's say one mean stress. Um, because one misses strength is based on the yield um, strength of the material. And it's usually used for ductile materials such as aluminum, which is common um, for um, wing use. But oh, okay. yeah, because we are incorporating composites, which okay. are brittle, we can't really use the yield strength. And okay. I believe it's, even if we search yield strength of high strength, um, yield strength of graphite epoxy, I don't think we can even determine that because it is not an um, appropriate property of that composite itself. So. Okay. Um, again, there are multiple theories, um, multiple failure theories, um, which I'm actually learning right now in Dr. Sankar's class, but um, a lot of them are very, very um, high detailed, um, such as Sai Hill, Sai Wu, which is um, calculating the, um, again, it's, it's using the principal stresses, but we believe that for this, um, for this analysis, um, the absolute max pr principal stress could still um, serve as a, a big guideline in our safety factor analysis. Great, great. Thank you. Um, it was my mistake, actually, because all the other groups use uh, Lumina, so I, I was, yeah. <laughs> I feel like, oh, okay, now this is different. So I didn't know where that you use a composite material. So thank you. I think I learned something new here. Um, so next night, uh, next, next night, the fuselage copy design. And I can see the uh, notable specification. We have the 51, 12, uh, and, and- Oh, uh, yeah, it's, it says length <laughs> twice. Um, I yep. updated it in our, the, the 5.62 should be height. I updated it, but I oh, guess okay. the one that we're currently presenting with um, still has the error. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so that the, the second length um, was an error that uh, I guess, um, that correction wasn't incorporated into this version of the PowerPoint that we're currently yeah. presenting with. This Lohas is your friend, so it's, it's a friend of your group, so you can ask her to update on the website. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be more convenient. And also, for the finest ratio, 4.2. Uh, it's very low, yes. We're, we're aware. Um, I actually did some research. I know you said um, about six in lecture, but um, I was doing some research in some other textbooks. Um, I was looking at, uh, instead of the AIAA aircraft conceptual design by Raymer, I was looking at the aircraft design volume one AIAA textbook, um, which is a bit, it, I've managed to find some more info on fineness ratio. And based off of the uh, info that they have in that book, um, for it, apparently for purely subsonic, according to that book, it recommended, I believe it was three to five, if you're staying very subsonic. Um, and uh, we ended up seeing 4.2 at 
as being a bit more on the higher end of that as being okay, um, since we aren't going into the subsonic or a lot of the transonic stuff. Um, and also looking at our finest ratio, uh, the width of the fuselage was really uh, static just because our landing gear were outside of the engine, um, trying to move them somewhere else to decrease um, the maximum width of the fuselage would, we thought, increase too much of the weight and the drag that the fuselage would create. Um, and then increasing the length to increase the finest ratio while keeping the width would make the fuselage extremely long. Um, so we kept the finest ratio at the 4.2 and kept the length and the width as they were. Yeah, yeah, I agree that uh, the finest ratio does not have to be in the seven to eight where we have like different aircraft, like some are better, some are skinnier. Um, so uh, the thing I feel is that um, by looking at your aircraft, it the final ratio should be much higher. You know what I mean? Because 4.2, the final ratio is the length above the maximum width, right? And if it's a 4.2, I would expect a much fatter uh, fuselage. Is there any calculation mistake or my we, is wrong? So we've been treating the engines and the landing gear um, and those nacelles um, as a part of the fuselage. Um, so we've been incorporating them into the fineness ratio. So that's why it seems so low. Um, it's because it's that whole width from absolute left to absolute right outside of um, either uh, semi nacelle, semi um, oh, inside so, the fuselage engine. Yeah. So you also include the, the two, um, the, the power plant, right? Yes, yes. Um, then you probably need to check the detailed definition of finest ratio. Should you use, really use the width of just mm -hmm. the fuselage or the fuselage plus the power plant? Okay. Yeah, because when we, when we say uh, finest ratio is 4.2, I would smell like it's a very <laughs> short and fat kind of fuselage, but this one is like uh, in the other direction. So you probably mm -hmm. can check the definition of finest ratio. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll look into that. Yeah. Uh, and the next one. I think I'm done. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Any other question from our audience? Uh, okay. Uh, Dr. Trump, do you have any question? <laughs> I gotta figure out how to unmute this thing. No, I, I'm just just stopping in to see how it's going. Where uh, we had a, we're just to give everybody context. We're running the mechanical engineering capstone uh, presentations in parallel. We had a group finish a little bit early, so I wanted to just pop in to, to see how this was going. But uh, seems to be going well. Thank um, you, thank you, thank you for your support all the time. Um, yeah, well, it's I, I used to coming. be an aero engineer. I don't. You guys <laughs> might not know that, but I, my undergrad degree is in aero engineering. I did a, a mechanical or a um, uh, a master's thesis actually in, in aero engineering, and then and then got lured away to the dark side by uh, my my love of, of energy thermal fluid sciences. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thank you. Okay, I, I think I need to go to other group. It's, it, it will start in two minutes. So um, uh, congratulations, great job, uh, and good luck on your final report. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.